Well, Thanksgiving, Christmas, welcome, welcome to Couples Counseling. Thank you for joining us today. Really happy, really glad that you're here. What brings you here today? Well, I just don't feel close to him anymore. Why is that? Well, I would say, like, when we first got together, um, we were like a team, you know? We did everything together. And the end of the year was always, like, our season. It was like Thanksgiving and Christmas, Thanksgiving and Christmas. But lately, every year, I just feel like it becomes more and more about him. Christmas. Yeah, just Christmas. So much Christmas. And, and no Thanksgiving. Just Christmas. Yeah, just Christmas, you know, like without me, and it really hurts my feelings. Oh, you're great. You're so great. I, I just feel like I don't matter anymore. Mm. You matter. You matter. To who? You matter. You're great. I promise you're great. Stop it. You're great. <laughs> you're great. You're great. It's, it's condescending. So when we got together, mm -hmm. you know, me and thanks, I like to call her thanks, mm. we just had so much in common. Like, she's really into her family, I'm family-oriented, so we had that going for us. Yeah, and the kids like them better now. That's not true. Yeah, yes, it is. All right, it's true. They like me more. I just like to have way more fun. Here, I got you a present. You're going to love it. Really? Yeah, open it up. It's, it's great. Thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Anyway, we don't even put up my decorations anymore, mm. okay? Look around. It's all Christmas. Mm -hmm. It's November, okay? Mm, yeah. But I feel like we go straight from Halloween straight into Christmas mm -hmm. lights. No Thanksgiving. Do you know how hard it is to find Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and fall decorations? Okay, but to my defense, Christmas lights are way more fun. How dare you? How long would the two of you say your problems have been occurring? At least a decade. Mm, I don't know. I don't think we have any problems. At least. I think that we're good. I got you oh. another present. Stop it. I don't want a present. Oh, wow. Okay? Okay. So what I'm... Clearly, the both of you are very passionate people. And what I'm hearing you say is, Thanksgiving would like a little time for herself. And to do what she does, and then when she is done, Christmas, you can come in and be Christmas. How does that sound? Thank you. And then we can get to Christmas? Yes. Okay. Absolutely, okay. So Thanksgiving. You mean so now I can just do like what I do right now? Absolutely. Agreed. Okay. And he's not gonna? No way. Interfere. It's your time. Your time to shine, your time to do your thing, girl. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, can you hand me that table right there? Sure. There you go. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, well, happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, I would just like to thank you both for being here to share in this meal. I would like to start by saying grace. So yes, beautiful. If we could close our eyes. Can I make a wish? That was inappropriate. Don't make a wish. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful night, for these beautiful people, and this beautiful meal. I ask that you continue to protect us and watch over us, continue to supply us with more and more joyous moments, friends, family, food, abundance, what, what are you doing? What? Oh, what dear. are you doing? What? This is what I'm talking about. What? It's Thanksgiving time. What are you doing? I don't know why you're freaking out. I, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I can't. I can't do this anymore. I, I, I gotta go. No. I really got No, no, don't go. Where are you gonna go? Listen, before you go and do something irrational, let's give him a call. Call who? You know who. Oh, oh no. No, I am not calling him. He's crazy, okay? Plus, he's always on your side. He's a serious part of our problem. Like, you know that, right? Come on. Some people say he's a therapy guru. 
Um, okay, so I'm the therapist here, so who are we talking about? Black, Black Friday. Friday. Oh, dear. <laughs> He's one of Christmas's insane friends, okay? okay? The two of them go out every year, all night, carrying on about rebates and buy one, get ones. What? We're into economics. Friday always has like a deal he's working on. You know what I mean? Yeah. He always claims to have the answers to all your problems, latest and greatest, all the time. He's crazy. And he has no sense of personal boundaries. Last year, he called before we were even done with dinner. Oh. <sighs> he just gets me so pumped up. He's amazing. We at least have to give him a call. I know he'll have something that can help us. No, never. Th th that's not going to happen. Ser seriously, who is that? My BF. You, do you mean your BFF? No, BF, Black Friday. Unbelievable. It really is like I don't matter anymore. You know what? Excuse me for wanting a little attention. Have a holly jolly. Whatever. Wow. Okay. I know this is very unprofessional of me, but I have to say, I am a huge fan. Really? I am a huge fan. That means so much to me. You have no idea. I'm just going through so much, and I'm in so much turmoil. I got you a present. <laughs> There's a lot to think about. <laughs> we live in an interesting day and age, don't we? Where that is our reality. Where there's not a lot of time for the Thanksgiving part, and what's happened is we've started to look at that meal as the kickoff to the Christmas season. Right? It's just the first day of something else. And what I want to do for the next few weeks, right up until we get to Christmas, is reimagine the definition, to rethink the order of things. And instead of us thinking of Thanksgiving as the kickoff, we started to see Christmas as the culmination of the Thanksgiving season. Because the truth is, by the time we get to Christmas, we have the most incredible gift to be thankful for. Now, because of this newfound attention to gratitude, we've seen a whole new market develop over the years. Now, you've probably heard, if you read anything about how to have a healthier, happier life, they'll say things like, you need to become more thankful. In fact, they created these things called gratitude journals. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you have one. Several of us have several gratitude journals. In fact, if you went on Amazon and you looked up gratitude journals, you would find more than 4,000 options Different cover, covers, different kinds of paper, all sorts of things. And what's so amazing to me is where you will find gratitude journals. Not in the paper section, not in the notebook section, in the health section. Now here's what's so interesting to me. We've found irrefutable evidence that gratitude is a good thing. Like Christianity and, and religion aside, we have discovered that psychologically speaking, having a grateful attitude and a grateful heart is good for your soul. And if we have so many possibilities now to help us live that way more often, why in the world do we need a journal? Why do we need this thing that's going to remind us over and over again to be grateful? And if you step back even wider, why do we need a day every single year to remind us to say thanks? If it's so good for us, why are we not doing it on a regular basis? Why is it this thing that someone needs to spur us on to? I think it's because gratitude is short-lived. And you might have a moment where you're thankful, 
where you're thankful for your family, you're thankful for your dinner, you're thankful for your home, you're thankful for your umbrella, right? You have these moments where you're thankful, but inevitably something else comes along that distracts you from that gratitude. There, there's quickly another need that comes on the radar or another place to get, and we're just on the move all of the time. And our gratitude quickly becomes turned towards what we don't have, and we would be grateful if we had that thing. You need no more evidence of this than what has just transpired over the last couple weeks. A lot of us get done with Thanksgiving dinner and head to the mall, and we start doing our shopping because it's Black Friday and there's deals to be had. Now, here's what's interesting about our shopping habits when it comes to Christmas. Now, I'm not going to ask for crowd participation because you're not going to want to admit to some of these things. But starting on Black Friday, 58% of us will buy a gift for ourselves. And on average, we will spend $140 on ourselves during the shopping season. It's about us, right? Like, this is supposed to be when we go out buying for other people, but inevitably it becomes about us. And here's what's even crazier to me. The number one day for returning things to retail stores is December 26th at lunchtime. We don't even wait 24 hours. If we don't like it, we're going to take it back and get something that we wanted because we have a hard time being grateful for what we've got. A recent poll went out into the shopping areas and they were asking people, is there any place else that you'd rather be, and the vast majority of people said yes, but did you know 20% of people said I'd rather be sitting in a dentist chair than shopping for other people? (laughs) We're incredible. We're just naturally about what we don't have. We have a very hard time keeping our gaze on the things that we do have. You see, the problem isn't that you and I are just treacherous. I think that sometimes we paint ourselves, or paint others at least, as to be these horrible, horrible people. But I think it's simpler than that. I think it's more of an attention problem. You see, our attention is constantly on what's missing. When we survey what we have in our homes, or in our bank accounts, or in our garages, or in our pockets, right? we we don't quickly notice what we have, we quickly notice what we don't. And our attention gets fixated on that. So what I want to do today is talk about how do we realign our attention? How do we start paying attention to something other than what's missing? Because I believe with all of my heart is if, that if we can refocus our attention, we will start to change our intention. And here's what I mean by intention. What, what we're about in the next three to four weeks becomes radically different because we're focused on something different. We talk about this often, but you know, when you're driving down the car and you look to the side, your car will inevitably start to swerve wherever you're looking. Your body will follow what your attention is fixed on. So if we change what our attention is, our intention, or where we're going, what this is all about, will have to change, which means the very definition of what the Christmas season is all about will be altered. And I believe that by the end of this series, by the time we get to December 25th, you and I can have lived the previous month with an entirely different definition of what this is all about. And I think you and I will have the most wonderful time of the year again because we've changed what that is all about. There's a moment in the ministry of Jesus where this becomes fully displayed for us. It's one of of my favorite moments that you've probably heard about a hundred times before. But there's such an amazing principle that happens, and it's very subtle. And if we go slow enough, I think we we can see it. And so if you want to follow along in your own Bible or on your phone or iPad, we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke this morning, and we're going to start in chapter 17. And what I love is how Jesus illustrates and demonstrates 
his incredible understanding of humanity, and he does such an amazing job of helping humanity understand the beauty of gratitude. So we're going to jump in right at verse 11. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Now, leprosy is a disease that we don't come in contact with very often. But it was a big, big deal back in this day and age. Leprosy meant that you were unclean. And if you were unclean, you were unfit for worship. And if you were unfit for worship, you were unfit for community. And you had to live your entire life in isolation doing what I call announcing you're ugly. You had to tell everybody because according to the law, that was the rule. Just listen to what it says in Leviticus, the Old Testament law. Those who suffer from a serious skin disease must tear their clothing and leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth and call out, unclean, unclean. As long as the serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place outside the camp. Lepers were literally kicked out of town. And they had to go live on their own. And oftentimes they would congregate and they would form their own communities because they were done for. No one wanted them. No one cared about them. They were just unclean and had to be removed. Can you imagine if whatever ailed you, you had to announce to everyone? We use exclamation marks all the time now in our texts and in our social media posts. But when we see unclean exclamation mark, unclean exclamation mark, it was shouting. They had to shout to everyone that came around them, I am unclean. Don't come near me. Because if you do, you will be unclean and you will have to join us. And then Jesus comes along and these ten lepers approach him and he doesn't send them away. About seven years ago, I got to go to India where there are still leper colonies. People that have been removed from the main part of society and live on their own and it's only the Christians especially in that kind of thinking, karma thinking, you don't go and you mess with them. That, they deserve that. That's what karma has produced in their life. So it's only the Christians that will go and feed them and provide for them and touch them. It is the saddest existence. They're deformed. They're dirty. They're alone. So we cannot underestimate or overstate the power of Jesus not telling them to get away from me. At some point, they come to this understanding where they don't have to make the law announcement. You notice that. They don't say unclean, unclean. They just come to Jesus and say, can you please have mercy on us? And then in the next verse, Jesus responds. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And they went. They were cleansed of their leprosy. And we could talk all day about this moment. The the fact that their healing begins when they start walking. And maybe sometimes God calls us to start walking, start moving on what he's calling us to. And then we experience the good. But what's interesting to me is that Jesus, who has all the power in the world to heal them, sends them to see the priests. You and I have to understand that the priests were kind of the health inspectors of the day. And so you had to go to a priest to be officially called clean. So Jesus could heal you, but until a priest came along and looked you over and said, I don't see any more spots, and I believe this person is clean and released from the, old, the, the law of having to announce this and all of that stuff, you could not go on with your life. And I just love that Jesus understands that. And instead of resisting, he says, listen, go see the priest. I got you. And so they went. Big steps of faith. Ten 
people, big steps of faith, they start walking and they head off. And as they're going, the scales start to fall off and their heels, their skin starts to heal. And can you imagine the elation as they're walking and seeing what Jesus has done? And then we come to verse 15 and the whole dynamic and feel of this story changes. Ten people walk off. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. And we've talked before, if, you, if you're not familiar with who the Samaritans are, Google it. They were hated by the Jews. And Jesus consistently made them the hero of his stories. We remember the story of the good Samaritan. So the fact that it's a Samaritan, and we, we assume that the other nine were probably Jews, but it's the Samaritan, it's the dirty one, it's the outsider that comes back to Jesus and says, thank you. While the other nine continue to head into the temple to visit the priest. And it's easy for me as I read this to go, shame on those nine. How dare they? They get this great blessing and they don't have a minute to turn around and thank Jesus for what he's done. And then I'm, I'm smacked with the reality that I'm more them than I am this one. Right, because here's the pattern in my life, at least. I will regularly ask God for help. God, I need this. God, I got to have this. God, if you don't come through for this, everything else is going to fall apart. I need your help, and I ask. And I spend most of my time with God asking him for help. And then what's amazing, in all of God's grace and mercy, he gives the help. He offers it up. He comes through in some way and wows me. And I walk away going, God is good. God is great. And I'm so thankful. And then I take my second step and I forget the help. Subtly without thinking about it, what's been given to me becomes mine. As if it originated with me. And I don't see it as help that was given. I see it as help that I found. And then what happens is I get busy with the blessing. You and I get busy with our blessings. God gives us something, blesses us with something. And then we have to go about life. We have kids or grandkids or nieces or nephews. We have jobs. We have bills. We have parties. We have all kinds of things. And and we thank you, God. And then we get going and we're off to the races just like these nine. They're just enjoying the blessing. Remember, they're walking along and their bodies are changing and they're going, we're going to get to the priest and he's going to tell us that we're clean and we can move back into town and we can see our family again and we can see our friends again. And this is going to be awesome. And I can go get a job and I can, and we just get busy. Which is exactly what the next 21 days of your life are going to be, aren't they? Busy. It's not that you're not grateful. I actually think that these nine, they had a part of them that as they're going, had a grateful heart, but they were just too busy with the blessing to turn around and actually say something about it. Reality is for a lot of us, at least for these nine, Thanksgiving is an inconvenience. I got an appointment. I got plans. And pausing for this one to turn around and go the opposite direction of the priest where his ultimate dream would come true, for him to go in the opposite direction and sit down with Jesus and say thank you, that is counterintuitive because it's inconvenient. And notice how he does it. This is so, so important. Because I I told my child, he was at a birthday party yesterday, and I picked him up to leave, and I, I had to tell him, make sure you go say thank you. And he goes over to the mom, and he says, hey, thank you, and then he walks away. And I said, no, 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 you need to go back and tap her on the shoulder and get her attention and say thank you, which is exactly what this guy does. It's not a covert thank you. Did you notice that? He goes back shouting 
and he falls down at Jesus' feet. He's making a scene with his gratitude. He is doing it out loud. Everybody around is turning and looking at what is happening over here. And what this guy is doing is he's shifted his own attention towards Jesus and not from what he's going to get. And he's calling others' attention to Jesus simply because he's locked his own on him. It's an incredible dynamic. And he falls down at Jesus' feet and acknowledges that this blessing is from him. And everybody around that's hearing this is going, wow, Jesus is something. I need to know more. What this guy does is he reminds us that gratitude is not just an attitude, it's an activity. Gratitude is something that we do. It's not something that we cognitively agree with. And this man goes about doing that, and he draws other people's attention to Jesus, and Jesus looks good. And what my simple definition for glorifying God is, is that you make him look good. So, we glorify God by thanking God. If you want to make God look good in your life, then thank him on a very regular basis and do it in front of other people. We glorify God by thanking God. You see, so many times I'll talk to people and they'll, they'll hint at the idea that I don't know how to glorify God unless I go into ministry, unless I go into the mission field, unless I start a nonprofit that's going to help churches or something like that. And I quickly go, no, 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 it's way simpler and yet way more powerful than that. You do what God has made you to do and you thank him as you go and you will honor and glorify him. Everybody's attention gets redirected in this moment. And it all happens as the result of thanksgiving. And so we struggle every year with how do we make Christmas more about what it's supposed to be. And we think it's less lights or don't give as many gifts or read the Bible stories more. And I'm, this year for me, it's just, I'm just going to thank him more. As often as I can, I'm going to just thank God for everything that comes along in my day. And I believe that at the end, Christmas will have been different. Amen. Here's where I get this idea. It's from this interaction between Jesus and this man. This is how Jesus responds to him shouting. Remember, he's shouting. He's down on the ground at Jesus' feet. Jesus asks, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Did you notice what Jesus did there? He changed a word. The man comes back to say thank you, and what does Jesus call it? Glory. Didn't anybody else come back to bring glory to God? Didn't anybody else, in fact, some of your translations may read, didn't anyone else come back to give thanks to God? Didn't anyone else come back to give praise to God? Jesus says, didn't anyone else come back to bring glory to God for what he has done for them? You see, for me, bringing glory to God is we change what our attention is aimed at. This man is walking in a direction, all ten head off to the temple, and all of a sudden this guy goes, wait a minute, and he redirects his attention towards Jesus. And now, instead of moving that way, he begins to move back to Jesus, and so his attention has changed his intention. It's changed where he's going and what this is all about. This is no longer about his healing. This is about the glory of Jesus. This is about the thanksgiving to Jesus, and that redefined the entire thing. Here we are, a couple thousand years later, reading this account, and we aren't talking about the miracle. We're talking about the response to it. Redefined the entire thing. 
We change our attention, we change our intention, we change the definition every single time. And in so doing, we make God look good. We glorify God by thanking God. We change what this is about. And for everyone around us, it's changed what it's all about. You see, because thanksgiving is ultimately about recognition. Right? When you are offended that your kids don't say thank you or your grandkids don't say thank you, you've been there, right? This is one of the most irritating moments of your day if you're a parent. And even if you're not a parent, you've been around someone in your office, you bail them out, you hand them the report that they were supposed to do, and they just go about their business and you go, they didn't even say thanks. Or you've been in traffic where you stopped and you were kind and you were Christ-like and you let that person who went down, even though the sign had been telling for 10 miles the lane is going to end, you're kind and you let them over and you get mad when they don't wave. (laughs) Because that wave is a thank you. That wave, that thank you is an act of recognition. The only reason I'm not in the ditch, the only reason I'm not starving, the only reason I'm not being fired is because of you. We want that recognition, and God deserves that recognition. And what recognition is all about is how we think about whatever has transpired. And so for me, our thinking is tied to our thanking. Who you're thanking, how often you're thanking, reveals what you are thinking about what you have. And even what you don't have. And so again, we we start to change when we make this about something else because when we change our thinking, we change everything. This is what Paul said in Romans 12 too. You probably memorized this verse. Paul wrote, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you Think, because your behavior will follow suit. Your attitude, your heart, it'll follow suit if you change the way you think. And I think we do that by thanking God more. And so this whole moment wraps up with Jesus delivering a very simple phrase. He says, and Jesus said to the man, stand up. And go, your faith has healed you. His act of faith. And his act of faith is thanking Jesus, recognizing Jesus, thinking different about his blessing. That act of faith has made him well. You see, I grew up for most of my life trying to figure out what faith is. And sometimes I think it's just being really focused. Like I'm just going to have a lot of focus on God and that's faith. And sometimes I've thought faith is believing that God is able to do something. And other times I thought faith is taking a step when you don't know exactly where your foot is going to land. And it is. It's all of those things. But in this moment, Jesus says faith is when you glorify God, and glorifying God is when you thank him for what you have. So if you want to change everything, just start doing that. You see, I'm convinced that if you want your Christmas to be different this year, to be better this year, to be more Christianly this year, it doesn't mean that you don't put a tree up in your room. It doesn't mean that you don't buy a bunch of gifts for people. It doesn't mean that you don't put up decorations. It doesn't mean that every night you read the Christmas story again. Those would all be great if you decide that's what you needed to do, but I think it's easier than that. If we want to change Christmas, then let's change the way we think, and let's make it all about thanking him the whole way through. We have to inconvenience ourselves with thankfulness. So yes, this might get in the way of your baking, Because God is going to have a moment with you where he's going to be like, are you going to thank me for these ingredients? And you're going to say, well, I bought these ingredients. And he's going to say, well, do you know where you got that job that gave you the money that paid for those things? 
And can we talk about where you got the skills to get that job, to get that money, to get those things? Can we talk about where all of this has come from? And you're going to have to pause. You're going to have to turn jingle bells off for a minute so that you can thank him for what he's given you. And as you walk through the store or out to your car or the 15,000 Amazon boxes land on your front porch, with every one, our attitude should not be, they're going to love this. Or for 58% of us, I'm going to love this. <laughs> our attitude should be, thank you, God, for giving me this. Thank you, God, for allowing me to give them this. Because that's the whole point of Christmas anyway. At least that's what the angels said in Luke. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. So did the angels show up over that empty field and say, thank God for this gift that's lying in a manger in the middle of Bethlehem? Yes, they did. Christmas was about God giving us healing, God giving us belonging, God giving us forgiveness, God giving us love. And so the only right response is to glorify him, to make him look good. And we glorify God by thanking God. So here's what I want to do, and I'm gonna, we're going to walk through this quick because it's really, really simple. There are 21 days between now and Christmas Eve. And, and if you're like me, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, they're all blended together. It's all one thing. And so I want to give you what we're going to refer to as the 21-day gratitude challenge. Now, 21 days, if you do anything for 21 days, you know what they call that? A habit. It's now something that it's hard for you to not do. And so I want us as a community to get in the habit of being grateful. So here's how the 21-day challenge is going to work. You're going to stop by Walgreens or Office Max or Target or Walmart or anywhere that you like to shop, and you're going to buy a pack of Post-it notes. Get enough of Post-it notes for every member of your family. Super simple. Don't go buy a gratitude journal. You can do that in the new year. Ask somebody for Christmas. You just need post-it notes. And here's what we're going to do collectively. Every single day for 21 days, you're going to pull off a single post-it note. And on that post-it note, you're going to write a single thing that you are grateful for from that day. Now, most experts are going to say you should write down three to five things that you're grateful. We're going to take baby steps. One thing every day on a post-it note. And then you're going to find a blank section of wall in your house. And you're going to put those post-it notes up there. Now, you can do this as a family. And if you're a family of like 10, you'll have a bunch of post-it notes. You can wallpaper a wall. But you're going to put all of them up there. So every day you're going to go to this place and you're going to put these post-it notes up on the wall. And so that every day you walk by there, you've got this, this collection of things that you are grateful for over 21 days. And the reason we make it tactile and something that you've got to do is because it's, it's easy to forget that I'm just going to, in my own head and heart, thank God for one thing today. We're actually going to write it down, and we're going to put it on the wall. Now, I know some of you are like, I hate it when he says we should do things like this. I never do them. <laughs> I dare you to try this one. Try this one. 21 things up on the wall. And then on December 23rd, which is the Sunday before Christmas... Two, three weeks from today, you're going to take all 21 of those things down and bring them to church with you. And we're going to do something really cool with those things. But we, I want, I'd love for 100% participation. If everybody, 21 things, you can do 21 things. You can come up with 21 things you're grateful for in the next 21 days. One a day, put them on the wall, reflect on them and refer to them over and over again, and then bring them to church on the 23rd. We'll remind you about the 23rd. But what we're going to do is we are going to redirect our attention for the next 21 days. We're going to make this about what we have rather than what we don't have. 
Because you can't be thankful for what you don't have. You know that, right? Well, sometimes we can be thankful for what we don't have. Like I don't have illness and I don't have those kinds of things. So maybe that doesn't work. But as far as things go, it's hard to be grateful for something you don't have. So this will demand that you look at what you do have. And what's going to happen all of a sudden is you're going to find yourself heading in a very different direction because you'll have changed your intention with this. Christmas has become about something else. And you will get to December 26th, about lunchtime, when everybody else has run into return, and you will have redefined Christmas. And you will understand what we mean by thanksmas. We're just going to give more thanks as a people. And when we get to the 25th, we, we can easily thank God for the greatest gift of them all. We glorify God by thanking God. You could experience, this year doing this, you could experience more presence in the holiday. For a decade now, I get to the end of the year and I feel like I didn't even wake up for Christmas. I want to be present in it this year. This kind of intentionality will demand it. You might experience more pleasure or more joy. Instead of just going through the motions because it's that time of year and everybody has to bring a gift or everybody has to bring a dish, instead of just going through the motions, you may experience real joy in it. You might even, you might even experience the purpose of it in the first place, which is not about a tradition it's about Jesus, period. Let's pray. Lord, as we get ready to embark on this journey for the next three weeks, it will be easy to be distracted. It will be easy to give our attention to the presents that have to be purchased and wrapped, to the food that has to be cooked, to the parties that have to be attended, to the people that we have to please. We're asking you to help us be a little bit more like this leper who as he was going, remembered, turned around and fell at your feet. Help us to live at your feet for the next 21 days, thanking you, glorifying you for what you have given us. We love you, Lord, and we just want to get better every day at doing that. In Jesus' name, amen.